Yes, that, that, that adds to the trauma because, and also it's that sense of powerlessness, right? That you have no power over your life. Some other people are making decisions for you and they're making you move from one place to the other and not really, you know, where you don't really have a choice and you don't really have a, a, an opportunity to, to process the change, right? And, and you're already carrying the original trauma of the war that got you, that, that made you into refugee in the first place, right? right? And I don't know what's happening now in Denmark, but I remember that I was appalled when I first moved here in 2007 that uh, psychological support was not part of the package of the services that were offered to refugees. Uh, I, I, I was quite... Um, so they, these people were expected to, to land here from, you know, the war situation that they were sort of uh, forced, to, uh, to, leave the forced to leave and everything that they experienced in between with the refugee camps in the neighboring countries and then coming to Europe and then all of the things. Uh, and now they're expected, you know, they're given housing, they're given training, they're given this and they're expected to just get up and go. And it doesn't really work that way. And a country supposedly as developed as Denmark should know better. Uh, I don't know if there is more help now because I haven't been, um, because I'm working privately now. And that's actually part of why I work privately as well is, is because I want to work. I want to have the freedom to work in the way that I work, right? If I brought my approach to an organization that is helping psychological services, uh, they wouldn't take that, right? Because they have their own framework and, and usually they're not that open to um, us doing things that truly liberate us. Uh, so, so yeah, that is re-traumatizing. Yeah? You have the original trauma and then you are re-traumatized and then there's layers and layers of trauma that um, and then you're just expected to, to function in society. What causes stress? Do people uh, know uh, when do you have to know? Uh, when do I have to know? Or when do I know that I'm stressed? When do you know that you're stressed? And to seek help, you know, and to mm -hmm. avoid this stress. Mm -hmm. So stress is actually, one could say, a milder form of trauma, right? Because uh, the trauma diagnosis, well, the most common trauma diagnosis, now we have two, is, is called PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So stress, uh, stress is kind of the stressful part without the trauma. <laughs> uh, so the way that you know that you're stressed is that you, it can disrupt your sleep, you have a hard time um, calming down and, and finding, you know, you get agitated. Uh, it's hard to, to think straight and make decisions. You can become irritable. Um, very, you know, very small things can make you, uh, make you explode, have a response that doesn't match the, the thing that happened. Uh, you may feel tired, you know, fatigued, uh, yes, and, and jittery in your body, like uh, so, no, not finding calmness in your body. How to deal this, uh, with this, this, this problem when, uh, when it comes to mental issues? I know seeking uh, professional is one of them, mm -hmm. but besides that, there is any way where people can deal with this? Uh, you, in general or stress in, in particular? Well, in general. In general? Yeah. Uh, I, so, the, so the first thing is to recognize, right? Recognize that there is, um, that you are not mentally or emotionally well. And of course, depending on the, Depending on the intensity of the problem, you, you may or not, so if, if you're psychotic, right? So that would be at the end of the spectrum. I would say that stress is on the mild end of the spectrum or depression, depending on how intense it is. And then you have things like psychosis where you, 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 know, you may hear voices or see things or 
So on that end of the spectrum, um, it's very hard because you're not entirely in control of your, of your mind. So it's basically the people around you who are going to have to identify it. But here, you know, there's, there's a whole space where um, we can be able to, you know, we, we know when we're not well. We may, we may not be able to put our finger on it. So the first step I would say is to identify it and recognize that there's a problem. Um, I would say that the second step after that is slow down, you know, find a way to slow down, whether it's just giving yourself. So if, if you, you still have to work to, to live, to eat, when you come home, give yourself some time. Don't just go and watch TV or just don't go online or, you know, just give yourself some, you know, either some silent time or some meditation time, some time to just be with yourself. Because when we slow down, then we can hear ourselves, we can hear our thoughts, we can hear our intuition, and our intuition will guide us as to what to do. It might say, you know, talk to a friend. It might, you might think of a friend that's trustworthy and you're gonna call them. And then you're gonna call them and you're gonna talk to them and they might give you an idea of what to do. And as you, if you give yourself that regular time to slow down, whether it's in, just in silence, in meditation, or reading, right? Reading, not on a screen, but, but reading. Um, not the news. <laughs> don't, don't read the newspaper. <laughs> That's not relaxing. <laughs> you know, read poetry or read fiction or... Uh, then, then you get in touch with yourself because really my definition of, of, of mental illness is, is really misalignment, right? We live this modern lifestyle is very unnatural, right? We live... We don't live in accordance with our nature. We don't live in accordance with nature around us. So, so we do this, right? So if this is our center, right? We go here or here. This is and our spirituality? Yes. And, and, and so it feels off. So, so this is also, that's one way to read mental illness symptoms right is that it's our body telling us whoop you're going far here you need to come back and silence will realign us and when we do this then we'll be able to um to follow our inner guidance whether that takes us to therapy or it takes us to meditation or it takes us to uh i don't know the grave of you know your father with whom you were really angry and you never got to sort things out with them and maybe have a conversation with them whatever it is that you need that is going to be healing for you you you'll be guided to it but you you first have to uh create that space and silence for yourself i see many people of color or blacks to be more specific that are acting uh, like angry towards other one another um, that leads or creates of we say that people are kind of mentally distressed or why cause this kind of anger that other people always are well I want to start by saying that anger is is an acceptable feeling like any other I think that I think that we have a right to be angry I think that as, as a people, as a race, sort of collectively, we have a right to be angry. Um, and then when, when, when we are angry, when we have anger and we can't, there's no resolution to the problems that are making us angry. Whoever is around us, that's who's gonna get the you know that's who's gonna get our anger because because they're right here they're accessible and I'm gonna get my anger out on them also because the people around us can be very safe targets for our anger right uh, subconsciously we kind of know that if we are angry at each other um, we are not necessarily gonna get into much trouble for it but if we go and express our anger to the people and structures that are actually making us angry, 
uh, the consequences might be might be more dire. So I always like to talk of solutions as well. So for me, part of the part of the process for us individually and collectively is to transform that anger into something else. So not suppress it, right? Not because I find also that a lot of a lot of black people go around suppressing their anger because you know for women they don't want to be called an angry black woman. Uh, for men they don't want to be um, viewed as threatening, you know, especially in this society. It doesn't take a lot for a black man to be perceived as threatening. Sometimes just standing <laughs> can be threatening. Uh, so a lot of us uh, swallow, swallow our anger. Um, so so we, we shouldn't do that. Well, shouldn't. There is no shoulds. So that, that's not beneficial to us, right? Because, because then it comes out random in different and, and, and bigger ways than if we had attended to the anger. So the other alternative is to lash out. That's, that's also not beneficial because then, um, first of all, you, you didn't do anything with your anger, you just got some relief in the moment, and then it creates uh, relational problems. It makes, it makes for example, the, you know, you're talking specifically about the, you know, anger, I'm going to call it black on black anger. Um, it, it, it continues, it perpetuates the divisions between us. Um, so the work, I think, is to process that anger by f acknowledging that the anger is there, acknowledging that you have reasons to be angry and you have a right to be angry. Um, try to identify the things that are at the source of your anger and then transform that anger into something else. And the best way to transform anger into something else is 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 to to act action you know to think about what can i do about this thing that is at the, that is at the source of my anger you know Audre lord um wrote an essay called the transformation of anger into action i think it is uh, that's a good essay to read for example so that's a good recommendation um we identify the problems that are really at the source of our anger and then we try to find constructive action at whatever level we can to, to change that. And that's really using our power, right? Just lashing out is, is, is not empowering. Uh, to transform the anger into action is, is, is to use our, our innate power. Which type of treatment that you used, uh, you used to, to solve? Uh, the problem of the people uh, with these mental issues. I just talk to people. I just listen to them, really. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly, I think 90% of it is just me sitting there and listening to them. Um, yes. And, and, you know, people often say, I don't understand. We've just been talking. We haven't even done anything. How how can how can I be changing so much? Uh, but and I think that also says something about. Of course, you know, therapists are highly trained in ways to listen and different levels to listen. You know, of listening, and everybody can't do that. But but there's something about listening to each other more, you know, creating that space for ourselves where we, we listen to each other. If we do nothing else and just listen, that, that in itself will bring, will bring great change and healing. Now the question that I want to ask, uh, I hope will not come many, is about, um, I see in the continent, in the African continent in general, all the 54 countries, you've got this, uh, I think, a big trauma of uh, thinking what happened to this colonization. Uh, do you think it will be a useful a way to kind of everybody be having a session of, uh, with a psychologist in order to know to identify themselves? Seems like in many, many people are losing their uh, 
blackness, if you may say that. Yes, their connection to their to their authentic selves, yeah, to mm -hmm. the culture. Yeah. I think that's a great question, and there's so many answers to that. So the short answer is yes, um, but obviously you can't. You can't do one-on-one -on -one therapy with that many people. <laughs> but I do, I do think that, I do believe that uh, the answer, a big part of the answer to Africa's development, for lack of a better word, and I'm using development as in moving forward, the, 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 the the biggest part of the answer uh, in Africa's moving forward, I'm going to say it that way, is healing. I have no, no doubts about that. And I think that it would be very useful for us to collectively sit down and think about how we could do that. I don't think we could necessarily do that uh, with sort of one-on-one, -on -one, but we could definitely do some, some group processes at different levels to achieve that. We could um, generate a public conversation about it, a public continent-wide, actually not just continent, I think continent and diaspora, because it's, I see Africa now, not just as continental Africa, but kind of all, all of her diasporic arms, um, and I think we, I think we would benefit from having a collective conversation about about that, about about healing, and how do we do that? How do we, how do we plan it? How do we do it uh, in our communities? How do we do it at the country level? How do we do it continent wide? How do we do it globally? Um, and and there are things that can be done, you know. And I think the first, first thing is is recognizing that, and and the second thing is is beginning that conversation. Um, and I think it's we're getting there actually. I think I think we're getting there. But but you're right because colonization was exactly that, right? The way that the the way that uh, colonization was achieved and the way that we were neutralized in order to be dominated was to separate us from who we are, right? From our culture from our, 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 our spiritual traditions and practices, from anything that was African. You know, in, in, in the case, you know, you and I are both Angolans. From language was a big thing uh, in the way that the Portuguese um, colonized. They really tried to, they didn't kill it, but they caused great, great separation uh, in the, the language thing. Um, so, you know, if we, if, even in our thinking, you know, we are thinking in someone else, in the language of those who dominate us. There are limitations to how much we can think outside of that, outside of that, that prison. So, yeah, we, we need to do that. It's the last question, probably. I hope so. <laughs> Where they can find you? Uh, so I am, um, yes, I can be found on Instagram, uh, that's the easiest because it's easy to remember on Instagram, my Instagram handle is um, Black Woman Therapist. I can be found on Facebook uh, by searching Yema Ferreira and I have a, I have a Facebook page or on my website yemaferreira.com. It's not expensive, right? So people do live well, having a session that's, with you. Well, that's relative, right? It's expensive if you don't have the money, and it's not <laughs> if you do. <laughs> but it's not expensive. Uh, no, so I, compared to, if I look at my other colleagues in the market, no, I, I'm definitely one of the cheapest. Um, so I tried to find a rate that can give me a, a living and not completely exclude people from accessing therapy. Uh, but I'm also very aware that even so, there are a lot of people who want, who would like to do therapy with me but are not able to financially. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of ways and talking to other people in the community about ways to solve the problem of um, people not being able to access therapy because they don't have the money. So um, hopefully in, in, you know, within the next year or you know, within the next year, um, I'll come up with a, a solution for that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Appreciate it.